officially designated in newspapers on December 20th, 2018, and by posting a copy on the commission's website. Thank you. Nancy, could we have roll call, please? Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Ashman, Commissioner Avery, Here. Commissioner Barr, Here. Commissioner Chila, Commissioner Galetta, Here. Commissioner Howell, Here. Commissioner Janerone, Here. Commissioner Lloyd, Here. Commissioner Lobauer, Here. Commissioner Pickleski, Commissioner Prickett, Here. Commissioner Quinn, Commissioner Rowan Green, Chairman Earl. I'm here. All right, if we can rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. First meeting on the agenda is the adoption of the January 11th minutes. Do we have a motion? I'll second it. Any question or comments on the minutes? All right. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? All right. Next, we'll move quickly on to uh, committee and staff reports. I have a summary here of the policy and implementation committee meeting. Um, which was held on January 25th. Uh, in summary, the committee adopted the minutes of the November 30th uh, committee meeting, and uh, at that uh, meeting also recommended certification of a Stafford Township Ordinance, uh, revising a planned unit development uh, in a highway medical commercial zone, and also uh, Winslow Township Ordinance adopting the Maressa Redevelopment Plan. The committee also recommended the commission approval of an amendment to the Pinelands Infrastructure Trust Fund Master Plan. Uh, the PNI committee also received an update on a revised MOA with South Jersey Transportation Authority and discussed potential offsets uh, for the removal, um, which is required by the FAA, of the existing 290-acre grassland conservation area. Uh, and then lastly, the committee received an update on the Clayton Mine in Woodland Township. Uh, the applicant has agreed to deed restrict the approximately two thirds of the 1400 acre site for conservation and expansion of the existing mine will excuse me be permitted on the remainder of the property um, that's it for summary of the p i meeting from january 25th any questions on that all right seeing none we'll move on to staff reports we'll start with nancy okay um so the federal shutdown ended and we rather quickly heard from uh, our contact at the National Park Service. We've been having good discussions and moving along quickly with them uh, when Jonathan Mead reappeared, but then the shutdown happened. So now we are scheduling to go to Philadelphia to meet with them to discuss going forward our monies, our agreements and all that. And maybe I'll get some more information about an appointment of a commissioner from there so that was good um and and we i believe we finally have a date scheduled for the energy and sustainability committee um we had a little difficulty corralling the commissioners um staff participated and watched a climate change webinar the other day so we're continuing to add to the pile of things we've been accumulating over the years that could, you know, inform that group. So that was good. Have a good number of staff who came to participate and learn from that. So that was good. Um, we submitted comments on DEP stormwater rule. Um, they were plight. Um, we had some issues. We always, we have some complications with the stormwater rules because we rely on some of them, but not all of them. Sometimes we do our own things. Sometimes we follow DEP. So staff and, and Stacy worked together and we got some comments out to them. And that's all I have. Questions for Nancy. All right. Uh, just two items I wanted to mention. One is uh, uh, Commissioner Galetta has asked us to relook at the issue of, of town management areas. It's, it's timely today. We're going to talk about the PITF. And towns are not eligible for PIDF. And the question is, really, why not? Is there anything we can do about it? Uh, it's a little complicated because the, you know, we, we can somehow 
change the CMP to make them eligible, or we could ask for new legislation with perhaps more money. So we're going to look at several options, and uh, I think he's encouraging us to do that. Is because it's going to take time. Change the CMP takes at least a year if, if everything's working well, uh, and to get new legislation, which would, would require a vote as well, by the way. So uh, we're going to look at that. The other thing I wanted to show. Uh, is uh, I, I told you we're going to start putting data up on the web as soon as it becomes available, uh, and uh, we've done that. So we have about six or seven data sets that you go to our website. There's a list there. You see the third column. You can see it. The underlined ones have data. So if you click on one of those, it's the same report that we put in the annual reports, but it's updated. So it has a new analysis, new charts, a new list of towns and everything. So, And it also has a, a subscription feature. A town can subscribe to it, and when we put a new one up, they get notified. So we're starting to do that. And we have about 21 parameters or 22. As I said, mentioned, we've done six or seven, and we'll keep doing them as we get the data in. So it's a new feature just to try to get the data out a little faster than we have in the past. That's all I have. I think that's uh, can individuals subscribe also? Yeah. Yeah. So they get yeah. yeah. Anybody. 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 Okay. Thanks. I think that's terrific. I mean, you have a notice in Minnesota how it has a notice when it's current. You know, like what's this about? You know, hopefully they look at it that way, not think it's spam. It's well, we'll see. But I doubt it's going to become that better. Some people like paper. <laughs> we got that when we had our meetings with people. They would like to have the old paper reports. And we, we will do some of that, but we just thought, as we get the data in, why not get it out? So that's what we're trying to do. Gina's done a good job getting it out. So. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Larry, uh, Susan, and Gina, I'd like to thank you for looking into the possibilities of the PATF for the uh, towns. Um, something I'd like to bring up to the commissioners, uh, back in 2011, when we had the uh, memorandum of agreement uh, uh, amendment and for Buena Vista, that was actually part of the MOA to actually uh, research towns being eligible for the PITF. We've been a little bit delinquent on that. I think we all forgot, but the town certainly could use the uh, funding for infrastructure. So uh, just a, a bunch of things for infrastructure. And I think it's really worthwhile we look into this. But thank you, uh, Larry, Susan, and Gina. That's all I had. Any questions for Larry? Uh, good morning, commissioners, members of the public. A few things of interest to note. On January the 30th, uh, Ernie Demon, Bronwyn Ellis, and myself of your staff uh, conducted a seminar at DEP uh, for the morning to review the commission's rules and regulations. It uh, was attended by approximately 75 DEP staff members. Uh, I thought it was a very beneficial seminar. Uh, there are a lot of new faces at the Department of Environmental Protection, so I think it was very helpful uh, to provide an overview of, of the pine lands and how our regulations do or do not uh, interrelate with, with the department's regulations. On Friday, January the 29th, uh, Kelly Jackson, your staff, and I met with the clerk of, of Medford Lakes. Uh, the Metro Lakes clerk was interested in coming in and discussing, uh, in particular, some of the issues that are raised with Metro Lakes having a what's referred to as a locally designated historic district. And there's not a lot of future development potential in Medford Lakes, in my opinion, but they do receive a lot of applications for additions, for demolitions uh, of existing homes, and it, it, it does raise a number of issues. Uh, with both the uh, Metro Lakes Historic Ordinance and the Commission's regulations. So the purpose of the meeting was just to discuss how the process unfolds. Uh, there was no particular controversy, um, but I thought that was very helpful also. I wanted to note on the third item that back in the fall, we had received in a request uh, from the three major utility companies that are participating in the right-of-way vegetation management plan uh, of their interest uh, of applying herbicides to some test plots in the Pinelands area. The Commission's regulations are, are very specific in that uh, herbicides cannot be applied to utility rights away in the Pinelands area. Under the vegetation um, 
management plan and the pilot program that's in your regulations, there's a provision that allows the executive director to make minor modifications uh, to that pilot program. In this particular instance, uh, we're going to advise the utility companies that that's not a minor modification to the pilot program. And that may be an, an issue that's discussed uh, before the commission this coming fall. Sorry. This may be an issue that's discussed with the commission this coming fall as the right away plan will be reviewed. Uh, it's been 10 years has lapsed, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's time for a, a report to the commission on uh, this, the uh, whether or not the plan has been a success. Just two more items. Uh, one, I wanted to note that uh, on the 25th, we did receive a new application in uh, proposing vegetation tree clearing uh, for the Bass River Fire Tower. That application is currently under review by the staff. Uh, I'm not certain, but I anticipate that it will be on for public comment at the March commission meeting and for a commission action or vote uh, at the April commission meeting. So that's the tentative schedule. I just wanted to give everyone a heads up on that. And the last thing I just wanted to note is on, we're having a meeting on February the 22nd with the Department of Transportation, the New Jersey Department of Transportation. There's an existing MOA that the commission has with the Department of Transportation that allows for the use of herbicides, uh, on limited use of herbicides on certain right-of-ways in the Pinelands for vegetation management where it's not safe uh, for people to be out hand removing weeds. And we're going to be reviewing with the Department of Transportation staff members that the provisions of that MOA and the requirements of that MOA. That's all I have. Questions for Chuck? Hey, good. Chuck, on the, is the right of way plan, uh, is that a pilot pro program? The right of way plan is a pilot program. It's a 10 year pilot program. Uh, and at the end of the 10 year period, uh, the executive director is to submit a report as required by our regulations to the commission, recommending what action the commission should take. The actions can range from uh, incorporating the pilot program into the CMP as is, continuing the pilot program for X number of additional years, or amending the pilot program. So that report will be coming to the commission though in the fall. Okay. Thank you, I didn't realize it was a pilot program. It's been 10 years, so I guess I assumed it was, it was permanent, more permanent than that, thanks. Any, anything else for Chuck? Right. Susan? I have one thing. A happy thing. Today is the commission's 40th birthday. Wow. 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 40 years ago, Governor Byrne issued his executive order that called for creation of the Violence Commission. So happy With birthday. It's cause for applause. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> How about you, Paul? I can't top that, but uh, I can tell you that we did get our certificate of occupancy for the exhibits, and that was exciting, right? Nothing? No applause? Um, yeah, so that's obviously great news. We're up and running. It's open. We created a new web page. Uh, I uh, put together a marketing and use plan. The it's used internally that specifies, spells out responsibilities for maintenance and how we'll handle visitors as far as if we have a large group, how do we deal with that? Um, so we're prepared, we're excited about it. Uh, things are going well. Uh, and if you wanna take a look at it when you're done to get a look at the terrarium, for example, there's a lot of uh, plants that have emerged, a lot of carnivorous plants that are actually eating bugs in there. It's pretty neat. We had some bugs hatch in there mysteriously. Um, so, anyway, uh, meanwhile, the, the 30th annual Pineland, Pineland Short Course is March 9th at Stockton. Uh, thus far, we have 375 people signed up. Uh, things are going along well. We have a full month of registration ahead of us. Uh, if anyone has any questions on that. Uh, we've scheduled our annual Pinelands orientation for newly elected officials. This is the joint venture with the Pinelands Municipal Council that will be held on July 23rd here. Um, uh, obviously, uh, all commissioners are always uh, encouraged to attend if they would like. I know we've had some in the past. Um, try to keep keep it uh, up to date for you. Uh, I think that's pretty much all I have. If anyone has any questions, thank you.
Rick, I know you had a question. I have a question for Larry. Are there any questions for Paul before we step back? All right, go ahead. Uh, Larry, at the last meeting, um, Buena Vista was here talking about their sewage treatment facility, the membrane facility. They talked about adding two screens to that system. And I was wondering if uh, that would fit the Pinelands Infrastructure Trust Fund. Uh, would that be something that they could apply for to, to have those two things installed? Well, two responses. First of all, it's Buena Borough, not Buena Vista. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Buena Vista shares in some of the wastewater treatment or, or could. Uh, both Buena Borough and Buena Vista have town management areas. So it basically relates back to Paul's request. That, so they are not eligible for the PIGF. Um, and, and part of the reason we thought about it way back in 2011, even earlier, and that was that both Hamilton and Buena Borough are, are two of the perhaps the only two towns that have municipal wastewater systems in them. And, and they had expensive needs there. And, and uh, we've never funded them. They, they've gotten past those, but they're going to have future needs as well. So the, the, they're two examples of why, along with Hamilton, we would look at the trying to add those in the future. But no, they're not eligible. They're Thank eligible you. for state assistance, but not for else. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Okay, move on to uh, resolutions that we have. We have uh, two resolutions in front of us, the first of which uh, is a public development uh, application in Winslow Township for the new Brooklyn Lake Dam. Do we have a motion on that application? So moved. Second. Second. Right. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Anything from staff on this one? No. Okay. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Move along. Next up, we have a uh, public development application in uh, the borough of Woodbine, uh, and it's uh, road improvements in a uh, in a right of way. Mayor Pickalisky is going to step out. Um, Paul Goodman, Florida Chairman, just to note for the record, um, Chairman Pickalisky left because he is the mayor of, of uh, when, um, Woodbine. I'd like to second that motion. Very good. Any uh, anything from staff on this one? No, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any questions from commissioners? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? All right. Moving right along. Can we flag down uh, Bill? You're all good, Bill. All right, next up we have a, uh, a waiver of strict compliance for a single family dwelling in Jackson. We have a motion on that resolution. Second. Again, anything from staff on this? No, Mr. Chairman. Right, any questions, comments from commissioners? All right, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> any opposed? Abstentions? All right, moving right along. We have some planning matters, ones that we had discussed previously at the uh, P&I uh, committee meetings. Um, first, we have a uh, order to certify ordinance, uh, an ordinance amending uh, code in Stafford Township. Do we have a second on that one? Second. All right. Are we doing anything on any of these uh, in terms of? <clears throat> okay. Just want to make sure I know we did previously. Um, so any questions or comments from commissioners on the staff for township ordinance? All right, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Extensions? All right, matter moves. All right, next we have a uh, in order to certify Winslow Township uh, ordinance uh, adopting the Marissa redevelopment plan. We have a motion. So moved. Second. All right. Any questions or comments? From commissioners. Everybody's quiet today. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. And then lastly, in terms of resolutions, we have a resolution to adopt the Pinelands Infrastructure Master Plan. We have a motion. So moved. All right. Anything from staff on this one? 
Nope. All right. Jim, I, yes. May I request that Larry give us just a, a brief breakdown of what you learned from the public hearing and what are the kinds of projects that the municipalities are looking for? Just uh, summary. We, we asked at the public hearing the issue of what should be the split between grant and loan. And we really didn't get much response to that. Uh, we, we'd ask individually at town, uh, we're proposing, you know, I, uh, 50% grant, 40% loan, 10% local share. And so we looked at that uh, split. And, uh, uh, the commission had also asked us to look at that. And uh, it's two different goals are, are being involved there. One is we'd like to see the money revolve as much as possible, come back to us, which would suggest 100% loan. If it's 100% loan, it's basically the DEP program. So the question is how much grant should we put into it? And uh, Basically, the people liked the split that we had. It wasn't an enthusiastic <laughs> cheering up and down, but nobody really raised any question about it, and they basically were, were fine with that. And so that's what we learned. Uh, I don't know, Gina, is there anything else? So the public, the public hearing, we had two people attend. Uh, one said positive. Things, said, you know, I read their comments. I was just curious whether any of the municipalities suggested the kinds of things they might want to uh, uh, supply. Sewer and transportation. Sewer and transportation. Yeah. We, we have a range that covers you know, water supply, sewer, and transportation. Uh, not many of each of those, but the, uh, like, uh, I don't remember one transportation, but the, they do cover it and then they would it's, uh, um, assist the towns a great deal and they all have the PDCs associated with them in their redevelopment plans. And so uh, they, they weren't really submitting those, those projects. They were looking at the, the way the program is going to be run. And just to remind you where, the way it's going to work is uh, after, assuming you approve it, then that sometime in the near future, we will issue a request for proposals. and. and with the regional growth towns will be eligible to submit things then. And we'll work with them to make sure their the proposals are good. And then uh, we'll review those per the ranking criteria and bring it back to the policy committee and the commission to potentially endorse those. And what gets endorsed then gets set up to DEP for implementation. And, and DEP will review it from their standards. And it also has to go to the legislature to get the appropriations associated with each of them. So it's a fairly long process. Uh, and the RFP might go out as early as next month. Is that I, I think so. Gia, is that working? Next month. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Larry, to follow up on, on um, Commissioner Glad and Commissioner uh, Prickett's question about eligibility for towns, if if we if we amended this DMP just for sake of argument to make them eligible, would they be eligible under these criteria, or would we have to change the criteria as well? I don't think we'd have to change the criteria unless, well, it depends on how we approach it in the CMP. There's several different ways we could do it. Uh, but uh, if, if somehow they're the equivalent to regional growth areas and they, they qualify under that, they would have the same criteria. Uh, and would that criteria allow for the tertiary treatment um, investments that Bune has made? Yes. Thank you. Good. Larry, um, is, does the commission have the ability to look at regional growth areas to find out wh which areas are, have sewage and which areas don't uh, within different townships and then perhaps target those townships and say this grant is, is available, infrastructure grant is available. Uh, maybe the townships might not even be aware of the, you know, the connection between their sewage system and the possibility of using the trust fund. We're, we're mostly aware of what, where the communities are. We don't have perhaps as good a mapping as, you know, where are the sewer lines. And some, actually, some communities don't know where their sewer lines are. <laughs> uh, but, uh, that, that's something that GIS is remedying over time. But I called every one of the regional growth areas personally and spoke to their, their engineers or planners and told them about the program and how they could be involved oh, and did. made suggestions to them. And, uh, you know, I generated some interest in at least eight or nine of the communities. We have, what, 23 regional growth areas, and some of them are very small and would probably never be interested in it. So, but uh, we have 11 or 12 fairly large ones, and, and they're in various stages of 
but uh, the old program was sewer. Not everybody's interested in sewer these days, uh, but uh, a lot of interest in some of our water supply and at least one transportation. So, uh, and after we issue the request for proposals, we'll get back to them again and say, remember us? <laughs> it's, not, it's not time because uh, I think they might need some help along the way. Do you also contact the MUAs? Yes. Okay. I know that township engineer can be different from the MUA engineer. Yeah, well, we, we started with the county MUAs because they, they tend to have a fairly good picture of what's going on within the, their jurisdictions. And so we asked them for leads. We asked if they had needs. Uh, you know, some of the county MUAs have regional treatment facilities that the towns feed into. And so there's, there's a great deal of leakages. So we contacted all the relevant uh, MUAs. Thank you, Larry. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Uh, so, Larry, does that mean the county MUAs are also eligible to yes. apply? Yeah. Why? Okay. Didn't realize uh, that. You know, they tend to, in terms of sewer, they tend to build the last interceptor. Uh -huh. So the, the communities feed into that the, the regional interceptor and take it to the, it tends to be regional treatment plants, except for Burlington, which is a different approach to things. Uh, but uh, so they're aware of it. Uh, I'm not sure I can think of a, county MUA that has a need right now, but yeah. uh, we want to make sure that it, if we weren't aware of something that, that, that they are aware of it. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on the uh, infrastructure master plan? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, we'll move on to public comment on public development applications where the record's not closed. So we really only have one application in the queue that is uh, eligible for comment at this time. That is from the Atlantic County Improvement Authority for uh, two parking lots and 50 spaces in Egg Harbor Township. So if there's anybody here to comment on that application, feel free to step on up. All right, we'll close that portion of public comment. We have quite a list of uh, master plans and ordinances that do not require commission action. Susan, any comment on any of any of these? No, we're good. Okay. So next, we'll move right along to a presentation regarding an update on Wharton. Sure. Um, well, at the last commission meeting, there were two issues raised specific to Wharton. One was about road access and the inability to um, gain access to certain parts of Wharton. This has been a very wet winter and significant. A lot of the um, unimproved roads in, in Wharton are flooded, were flooded, are still flooded. DEP put out a press release on it. Um, so that's what that, that is. It is not a permanent thing. It's a rain thing. Um, DEP is aware. And that's what that was. And then there was a second issue raised regarding a superintendent who was threatened and that there were threatening people in big trucks in Wharton. Um, that is a fact. There was a superintendent who was threatened. DEP is aware. State police are investigating. It, it is what it is. Um, it's not a continue. It wasn't a lot of people. It was, a, it was an isolated incident that was reported, and they are dealing with that. Um, and DEP is also currently doing a road assessment of all their roads to see where, where things are. And, and as you may recall, when we were discussing Wharton years ago, DEP was telling us then that they have a lot of roads that have been damaged or were damaged by flooding and, and more than they could ever possibly deal with. So they deal as they can, they prioritize, and it's a catch-up game. And I think this winter didn't help with a lot of rain. Um, so that's sort of the Wharton update. And then John Bunnell has been doing some interesting work um, on ponds, not just in Wharton, but all over the place. And as a result of that, he's come up with, with what I, I think is going to, is really fascinating and should be helpful, hopefully to DEP about sort of predictive way to look at off-road vehicle damage. So he's going to present that now. Morning, commissioners. Morning. So we just recently wrapped up two studies that were EPA funded studies and put out a report in July of 2018. And one of the uh, funding for one of these studies was obtained in 2011 to study natural ponds and funding for the other study was obtained in 2012 to study two types of created wetlands, shallow excavations and stormwater basins. 
And we, even though we got these grants on different years, we synced up the schedule to uh, finish them at the same time and write a single report that covered both topics and all three types of wetlands. These are all off-stream wetlands. So we had five major goals in this study. One was to develop a wetland inventory for these sites. So we used 2007 aerial photographs and we mapped 5,580 of these wetlands. There were 2,742 natural ponds. Most of these were open water and herbaceous ponds. We stayed away from anything on stream. We stayed away from uh, really shrub covered, tree covered wetlands. Um, we also mapped 1,690 excavated ponds. Now these are shallow excavations that were created to obtain fill for a culvert through a wetland or to obtain clay or sand or gravel in the past. We stayed away from really large sand mining operations. We wanted to keep these excavated ponds no bigger than our largest natural pond so that they were comparable. And we also delineated the boundary of all the stormwater basins in the pylons, both residential and commercial. For the, a more detailed assessment I'll mention in number five, we stuck with the residential basins for that. So we had these over 5,000 wetlands. Uh, the next step was to assess the vulnerability of some of these uh, ponds, natural ponds and excavated ponds. So we delineated the boundary around all of the wetlands. And then we looked at within a 500 meter radius around each wetland, we looked at the amount of agriculture and developed land that existed now. And then we projected it that build out what that would be for all the buildable land in that area around each wetland, just to give us an idea of which ponds would become more vulnerable over time with more growth. And then we can talk about that some other date. Uh, we also assess the vulnerability of ponds to offer vehicle damage using both aerial photograph surveys and some on ground surveys. And that's what I'll talk about today. We had another component where we kind of explored the use of dragonflies and damselflies just in natural ponds to see if the surrounding land use around these ponds had some effect on the community composition of those insects. And lastly, we compared 39 different biological and environmental variables between the natural ponds, the excavated ponds, and the stormwater basins to get an idea of how the two human-created wetlands compared to the natural wetlands in the region. So just to, so you know what we're all talking about here is, as far as off-road vehicle damage, here's a very large pond in Brennenburn State Forest that we've been monitoring water levels at for more than a decade. You can see uh, in the center here is our water level monitoring post. And, you know, obviously the pond is dry and people have driven in it. Here's a pond in Wharton State Forest that some of the commissioners were at several years ago when we did a field tour with uh, Rob R. Muller. Here's a pond, a natural pond in Peasley Wildlife Management Area. This is a really large pond with several rare plants. And if you look in the background here, you can see a house. That house has an off-road vehicle track in their backyard with water features and ramps and the pathway leads right to the pond. Here's a natural pond in Greenwood Wildlife Management Area. This pond was very, very remote and the only access was from a very narrow grown in road. So whoever was doing this damage was uh, obviously in a remote place with a lot of privacy. But we also have damage to excavated ponds. Here's the excavated pond in private land in Galloway Township. You can see from the milky color of the water, this was probably an old clay pit. And the most difficult part about these ponds is there's direct access because they brought machinery in there to create the excavation and that access is persistent. Even on preserves, there's a natural pond in Franklin Parker Preserve that's been driven in. Why do we care about this? Well, I guess I would argue that if you totaled up all of the area of those natural ponds and excavated ponds that we mapped, it only comes to 0.3% of the Pinelands area. So we're talking about a very exceedingly rare community type. Um, there are lots of different plants and animals supported by these ponds, including many rare and endangered species. Just to give you an idea, here are some uh, numbers from our two studies. So we sampled plants, dragonflies and damselflies, frogs and toads and fish in the natural ponds. We had 99 of those ponds. And you can see the total number of species 
of plants, dragonflies, frogs and toads, and fish. And then over in this column are the number of protected species. Now that is, you know, something listed as endangered or threatened or considered a rare plant or uh, something of conservation concern, the next level would be special concern. Uh, similar numbers for excavated ponds. We didn't do dragonflies and damselflies, but we found you know, a lot of different plant species and some of the different species that we found were also of conservation concern. So they're very special habitat types. Now in the past, the state has used a couple different methods to try to prevent people from driving in wetlands. Uh, one of them is this uh, flexible brown um, sign that you can put in the ground and put different stickers on there of what's allowed and not allowed on that trail or that road. Well, people just drove right around or over these signs. Another method was to install much more permanent metal street signs at all of the major entrances to Wharton State Forest. Now the signs don't prevent you from doing anything, they just alert the, the driver that there are rules for vehicle uses in the forest and you might want to read those rules. One of the most recent things was a little cooperative effort between the Commission and DEP and volunteers to actually physically block some of the access to some of the more the ponds that were more readily accessible and more heavily disturbed. Uh, this is actually a pond that we started surveying frogs here in 1993. I've been here since 1989, and this pond was driven in then. And we actually named it 4 by 4 pond because of that. So it's really nice to see this uh, physical barrier here because, to my knowledge, nobody has driven in that pond since. So what did we do for our surveys? So as part of those studies, we mapped, as I mentioned, the 4,432 ponds. 2742 natural, 1690 excavated. That map of the Pinelands area shows all of the ponds, all those little dots are ponds. And the dark gray green blobs are state owned land. Parks and forestry land, the state parks and state forests, fish and wildlife property, the wildlife management areas, and natural lands trust preserves. So all of the, uh, you can see there's, there's ponds throughout both private and state land. We used aerofo so we, when we started these studies, the most recent aerofo photography that was out was 2007. So that's when we started mapping our ponds. So we stuck with those photographs, even though it is, you know, several years old by now. Um, and we assessed 3,585 of these ponds using the photographs. And we went to, we partnered with PPA and DEP and went out in the field to 847 of these in person to actually see whether there was damage at these sites. And for those on-ground surveys, we focused on state land because that gave us immediate access and permission to access the sites. Although for the EPA studies, we did study a number of private um, ponds and we used, we used that permission for accessing those sites. So we do have some from private land where we went on the ground. So what did we find? Well, we found 195 of those ponds were damaged, which is only about 4.4%. There were 84 natural ponds and 111 excavated ponds. 46 of the ponds had extensive damage. I would imagine extensive damage would be like some of those examples that I showed you photos of. We found damage was done by motorcycles, quads, and trucks. There were from one to six access points into the ponds. Of the 847 that we surveyed on foot, 18 of those had access, but no visible damage. So those are likely vulnerable, but have not yet been damaged. We found yard waste dumped at seven ponds, debris piles dumped at 14, trash piles at 60, ditches or fire breaks uh, went near or into 20 ponds, and stormwater pipes drained at 10. We found party spots at eight ponds where people would congregate at night, you know, sit around a fire and drink beer. Uh, 49 of the ponds that were visited were recommended for immediate protection, and 32 of those were already damaged. So this map just shows, again, the Pinelands area, the state land, and all of the ponds. And the ones that are lit up in red are the 195 damaged ponds. So for all of the ponds in total, the 4,000 ponds, 60% of them were on non-state land, and 40% were on state land. So just looking at all the ponds in total, the 4,000, we had about 3% of the natural ponds that were damaged 
and 7% of the excavated ponds that were damaged. And then if you break it out by who owns the land, still relatively low for non-state land, but you notice uh, there's a slight increase in the number of natural ponds that are damaged and a much bigger increase in the excavated ponds. And remember, I mentioned that excavated ponds all have access points directly into the pond. So we further broke this down into the, the state ownership, Fish and Wildlife Properties, Parks and Forestry, and Natural Lands Trust. And the interesting thing is the natural pond damage rate stayed about the same in all three of those land management unit types. But the percentage of excavated ponds that were damaged went up to almost 50% in the Natural Lands Trust properties. And we don't know why that is. It could be that those Natural Lands Trust preserves, they're usually much smaller properties. Uh, they're often purchased for a specific reason because of rare plants and animals in a natural or an excavated pond on the property. Uh, but they're, they're definitely seem to be, uh, they definitely seem to be more vulnerable. So one of the things we wanted to do is kind of develop a predictive model to, to maybe head off some of the damage in the future. So we had to look for variables that we had at all of the sites. We had 10 variables. So we had how big the pond was because we drew a boundary around it. We could look within that boundary and calculate the percentage of water herbaceous vegetation, shrub, and tree cover. So we had those variables. We put a, bu a bigger buffer around that and calculated the percentage of developed land and agriculture. So we had that for all the ponds. And then we used GIS to determine the distance to the nearest sand or paved road, the distance to the nearest commission approved Enduro route, because now those come to the commission digitally, and the distance to the nearest other damaged pond, because we noticed that when one pond is damaged, they must come out of that pond and look around for another one to drive in. So we have these clusters. So we put those variables in a pot and used logistic regression, a statistical method to see which of the variables were important. And we used the 195 damaged ponds and we randomly selected 195 undamaged ponds from the rest of them. And the goal was just to de determine the vulnerability of every pond. So the variables that came out important were pond size, so the bigger it was, the more attractive it was. The percentage of water and herb cover, people didn't like to drive in shrubs and trees. They preferred to drive in the more open water habitats. There was no relationship with the amount of developed land or agriculture around the ponds. The distance to the nearest sand or paved road was very important. The distance to the nearest Enduro route did not matter at all. There was no relationship there. And the distance to the nearest damaged pond was also important. So we use those five variables to develop a model to predict the vulnerability of all of the ponds. Just to give you an idea of what this would be like. So here's an aerial photograph from 2007. And on the right here, we have a pond that we've been monitoring for frogs since the early 90s. And you can see people have driven all through it, big trucks. And over here, we have a pond that was not driven in, but it's a high risk pond. It's really large, it has herbaceous zones all across the front. There's open water here that's kind of greenish. It's very close to a road and it's very close to a damaged pond. So that's 2007. When you look in 2012, that pond was accessed and driven in. So one of the things to notice is there's really no access point here, but you can see they've created one. All this sand is now exposed and all of the tracks radiate from this point. So this is one of the ponds that we blocked off with DEP's help. Well, actually DEP and their volunteers did all the work. All we did was let them know which ponds we thought were most damaged. So this was the largest barrier that was installed to protect this pond. And I have yet to see anybody drive through it. So it seems to be working. So one of the things we wanted to do was create a risk map. And you could use these data to develop all kinds of different things. So once we determined the probability of vulnerability Using that model, you could break it up into high, medium, and low is what we did, you know, red, yellow, green. So the red are greater than 75% chance of being damaged. Yellow is 25 to 75, and green is a very low risk, less than 25% chance. Now, even though we had ponds that we knew were damaged, we put them, we developed a, a probability for every pond. So some of the ponds that we knew were actually damaged may have come out 66% chance or something like that. But it gives you an idea of, of where the hotspots might be. And you could categorize these risks in any, any ranges that you wanted to. We just did 25 and 
50%, 75%. But where do we go from here? Well, we'd like to publish these results in a technical journal because some of the cursory looking that I've done so far, it's very, very difficult to find any hard evidence of other people documenting physical damage to natural resources like this. Uh, we, as part of the grant proposal, we said we would provide a GIS layer uh, to DEP. We could certainly do that and let them know which ponds we think are more vulnerable. We would continue to monitor for off-road vehicle damage at all of our monitoring sites that we routinely visit. And then anytime we come across anything new or unusual. And in the past, when we've uh, when we found damage to a pond as just part of our field work, we would collect on-ground photos and put together a little package with aerial photos and a description of of what, you know, what the deal was, and we would send that to the EP to let them know. So lastly, I just want to acknowledge that uh, the, both of the studies were funded by EPA and the Pinelands Commission. EPA provides, provides us 75% of the grant funding, and the commission matches 25%. And then a number of individuals from besides the science office from the Pinelands Commission, like Joel Mott and a summer intern, Erica Schoenberg, and a group of people from DEP, as well as Pilots Preservation Alliance, helped with the on-ground surveys. So that's all I had. Very good, very good data. What kind of questions do we have for John? I, I'd just like to make a comment, Chairman. I, John, I, I can't thank you enough and the team that worked on that, that's extraordinary data. It's obvious that this is going to be really helpful in allowing us to try to prevent uh, future damage now that you've been able to work out that uh, probability model uh, that can, can help us anticipate where the problems are. Uh, I guess I do have a question, that is uh, clearly a lot of this damage is happening in private lands too. We don't have any jurisdiction over it, but uh, is there any thought to uh, possibly giving notice to owners of the ponds that are at high risk of damage to let them know that, you know, we've done this, we've identified your pond as a potential problem area, and uh, um, you might want to think of uh, trying to protect your pond with barriers, anything like that? That's a good idea. There's probably some liability issues in there for the landowner, too, <laughs> if people are accessing their property. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be enough on our plate to deal with the state-owned lands to, to start, but just thinking about it. Anyway, thank you. Thank you again to you and Joel and uh, Erica, the summer intern, and, and all the people who worked on that. Just a tremendous piece of work. Questions? Good. Yeah. Uh, really good work, John. Uh, question. Criteria differenti differentiating uh, ponds from lakes, the sizes, and... Uh, the excavated versus natural, is that just because one has an access point? Like historically, uh, most of the lakes in South Jersey are all uh, man-made. But after a, a period of time, I guess, they become natural? Well, um, the, the natural ponds that I'm talking about were all formed naturally through periglacial processes maybe 17,000 years ago. Vernal? Uh, exactly. People call them vernal pools. Okay. Um, I, I shy away from that word because that mean, that implies they fill in the spring and they often fill in the winter or right. fall. Uh, the lakes you mentioned, yes, there are no natural lakes in South Jersey. They're all man-made impoundments. Um, so we were looking for off-stream ponds, there, there no connection to the stream at all. Uh, that's what we were considering natural ponds, these naturally formed ponds. And the excavations were all human excavated habitats. You know, for a variety of reasons. We didn't always know why they were dug out, but they, you know, from what we've seen with other parts of that study, the excavated ponds are as valuable as the natural ponds as far as the species and the water quality that they support. And one other question. Uh, do you correlate with fish and game inventories? Like Hampton Lake just had a fish inventory done. Uh, do you get their data when, when they do such? Only if we, you know, request it from them. Okay. They, they usually give us the reports that they do. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Good work. Thanks. Um, first of all, great job, and thanks for the work that you did. Um, but back a few years ago when I first got here, uh, a topic similar to this uh, came up about damaged ponds and lakes in, in Wharton. And at that time, uh, 
enforcement was an issue, and I would imagine that it's still an issue uh, to prevent folks from doing these activities and, and things like that. Has there been any thought, and I brought this up then, and I'll bring it up now, um, to encouraging the DEP or the State Forest Service to um, use drones or other means of, of trying to catch these individuals in modern technology? Because I understand that manpower is an issue, um, but the pictures that you showed um, are absolutely deplorable. Um, and a lot, it really bothers me. I mean, seriously, it really, really bothers me and it should bother everybody up here um, and everybody that's watching this and listening. So whatever credence I can lend to, let's try to think out of the box of maybe some inexpensive things or maybe not some inexpensive things that we can do to um, prevent this and really not just every so often go and look and say, hey, this is damage, that's damage. You know, we'll never get it back once it's gone. So, so um, you, know, uh, can, you know, has there been any thought given, you know, given to that, given to that? We've been working cooperatively and continuously with the Department of Environmental Protection on these matters ever since it first came up. Um, much of what we do is sharing of information because we're out in places that sometimes they're not um, and we see things that sometimes they don't and then we tell them and you've seen some examples of how then cooperatively they figure out the best way to protect those places. So that's sort of how we're cooperating with them on that way. And in the past when we had started the conversation with DEP, there were discussions and you may recall, I think you were here then, that DEP came here and talked about all they were doing, drones was part of it, increased enforcement was part of it and they're continuing those efforts. I mean, these are very difficult. You know, the, the best way that, that we have found success, as JB showed, is that when we can actually protect an area physically in a perma more permanent way. Because what happens with these things and what's happening with, with DEP is you learn what works and what doesn't. So you try something, it doesn't work, and, and you shift and try again. But the people who are doing it are creating as quickly as, as DEP is figuring out ways to stop them. So it, it's it's a vicious cycle. But yes, we continue to have those discussions and continue to work cooperatively with them. And I guess maybe you mentioned it, and I, and I missed it, but you said there's 4,000 ponds. And did, how many of those did you, did, did you look at all? How many, well, I mean, what's the percentage of, of what you actually got to and how I mean, do you think it's actually worse than, than what you saw, or do you think it's less, or, or, or what do you, what, how do you think it breaks out? Well, we, we looked at all 4,432 ponds, it, just that most of them we surveyed using our photographs, and we surveyed 847 on ground. But that was in 2007 that we did the aerial photographs, and it has definitely become a bigger problem as time goes by. There were nowhere near as many uh, ponds destroyed when I first started working at the commission as there are now. So we probably underestimated the damage. Has there been some thought, I guess, to educating, to doing education? I mean, is that done? Can there, I mean, you know, as we catch these folks, I understand that some of them won't care no matter what they're going to do, what they're going to do. But maybe if some folks realize what they're doing, um, you can you can kind of educate them with kindness? We'll, we'll have public comment towards the end here. Um, is there a question? Was, was there an answer, Mr. Barr? When, originally, when we started these discussions, yes, it was, in, you know, there were many pieces of the puzzle, and that was one of them that they were working on. Okay. And I think that releasing this information is in, in its own way an important part of that education because it shows the extent and severity of the problem. So, and it's not just Wharton, it's, you know, it's everywhere and it's public land and it's private land. And so I think that helps when we will push that out with that kind of press and that kind of story that look how significant this is. So we will use that, this to drive that as well. But yes, it, it, you're right. It's a very important part. And you're also right. A lot of the people who are engaged in these activities are not going to care. So it, it sounds like 
um, these the wooden barriers that what do you want to we'll call them have been successful. Has there been any more installed since the first batch a while back? And, and if so, why not? Um, I actually was asking about that recently, and uh, funding and staff resources are a problem. So if there were more funding and more people to help, we could probably install more. You say we the DEP was coordinating those DEP, efforts? The DEP was doing it. Okay. In fact, Terry Schmidt deserves a lot of the credit for organizing all of that. Uh, she got together the volunteers and the machines needed to put those barriers in. The commission played a minor role in that, just informing DEP which ponds that we knew about that were the most damaged. And we just did that one push, and there hasn't been, to my knowledge, there hasn't been um, anything else installed to protect wet ones. Um, it just occurred to me that when we started this discussion, um, there's been a change in administration at DEP, and as much as we've shifted and are dealing with new people, perhaps it would be timely to have a few commissioners go to meet with the DEP commissioner and the appropriate upper-level people to, again, relay we have a better story now because we've been working cooperatively and that's been great, but maybe, you know, we shifted seamlessly to the change, but maybe it would be a good time to do that. Can you put a request out yeah. to them and then once you get a date, you right. can we coordinate use, which we commissioner We use this information to drive it and tell the good stories, but yeah, um, I think that would be, that might be Chairman, helpful. I'd like to volunteer to assist in that effort. As you know, it's, it's very near and dear to my heart. And I'd also like to thank Commissioner Barr for bringing up the, the issue about enforcement. I've got to believe that the model that you've come up with, JB, has, has got to be viewed by uh, DEP as, as little short of a miracle uh, because this allows them to narrow their focus from 5,000 plus ponds down to maybe a couple hundred that they know are at highest risk of, uh, of being plundered. So that was our goal for that model. And I think that's wonderful. That. And that, that too is a message I think should be reinforced with the DEP that look, we've got this great tool for you to help you narrow your focus for enforcement. Yeah. Thank you, and, and I had one other comment, which was, I thought was an interesting uh, factoid that you threw out there, which was the relationship of proximity to an Enduro track and damage didn't exist. So the good actors who are filing with the commission, filing a map, going through all the right processes are not leading to the damage you're showing today. It's the bad actors it's, it's, that, are, that are causing all this damage. And I think that's important because we, you know, we want to encourage appropriate recreation uh, throughout the pines and those who follow the rules seem to be doing, doing that and it's the others that aren't. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure I commended you for that as well. So. A brief question. How much did it cost, if anyone knows or remembers, to install the last set of, of wooden barriers? It seems like it would be useful to, to have a, a price on that. That's a good idea. I'll look into that because I have no idea. Because it's literally, what, like four by four? Or, you know, like just thick. Uh, they're, I think beams. they're eight by eight or ten by tens. Yeah. It's pretty heavy duty wood. I think most importantly is not what it costs then, but what it would cost now. Yeah. You know, what, what would it cost now to, to put but even with, with Commissioner Barr's suggestion about advanced technologies, it's it's literally wood with screws in it. It's not advanced, and you're saying that that's been pretty effective. So that seems valuable to know. This is a low-cost thing that would actually fix the problem. That's a good point. Okay. I have a couple questions. I was curious to see that the, the property under the New Jersey Natural Lands Trust as the most or the most extensive violation, even though it might be a smaller acreage, is that uh, is that a management problem? Or is there not the same level of administration assigned to those properties as there would be to fish and wildlife areas or parks? I would have to say that there's probably much less staff in Natural Lands Trust category of the state, but I don't know how that translates to the amount of people on the ground managing the land. Uh, I think the, the best protection is what is done by um, like Franklin Parker Preserve and things, some of that New Jersey Conservation uh, Foundation, just by having a lot of people on the site recreating helps prevent damage because people talk about it and report it. Right. We found that as well. The, the more you can encourage good actors, it reduces the bad actors because they don't want to be doing this kind of activity in front of 
uh, other people. In your in your assessment, when you only looked at state owned property, so some of the property that's on privately owned might be on municipal or county open space as well as you only did state properties. For the on ground surveys, we only went on state land, but we aerial surveyed everything. Right. So there might be a level of protection, an additional level of protection on some of the ponds that aren't reflect. It's not reflected in the report. Yes. And I'd like to know your your thoughts on um, given that there's limited resources for like the the wooden barriers and and other physical means. Where do you think the money would be best spent to protect undamaged ponds from future damage? or to go back and try and allow damaged ponds to be restored? Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, these actors definitely move around. When you block them from some place, they just go to another one. So that's, that's it. I think you'd probably, if you really wanted to protect the resource, would have to take each pond individually and what actually is being supported by that pond as far as plants and animals and what you're trying to protect. That might help steer whether you protect something that's already damaged versus one that's vulnerable. Uh, you know, bigger ponds probably support more species and more rare species than small ponds. We could probably even develop a statistical relationship there to point to the ones that are most worthwhile to protect based on physical attributes of the ponds itself. Well, the, the, the thought struck me when, with your example of the, the damaged and undamaged ponds in 2007 and then later the undamaged pond was damaged and you put the wooden barrier up. If you put the wooden barrier up before oh, it was damaged, it might have prevented that one from being damaged. That was what led me to that thought. Yeah. When you have a road that close, it, that's a no-brainer to protect those ponds. There are, there are roads out there that go through ponds. They were originally made however many hundred years ago or whatever that go right through ponds. And it's very difficult to stop that kind of access. Right. Well, you're not going to probably be able to protect them all, but I like the idea of trying to give some priority to, to, to DEP, who's a major landowner, or to other publicly owned entities that own land in the pine lands, uh, so that they have a better understanding of where they should be concentrating their efforts, either because of the eco ecological importance or the access potential that, you know, it's not damaged now, but it might be given what we know about access to sand roads and so forth. And we could easily summarize what we found by any land management unit, whether it be county or state or private, if anybody was interested. Okay, thank you. I had a follow-up question to that. One of the early slides of your presentation, didn't you list there were 49 some things that you surveyed that were in immediate danger? Or did I misunderstand what? It seemed like they had prioritized oh, just oh, oh. to an extent already. For, for the on-ground surveys, uh, we had surveyors note whether the pond should receive immediate protection. So yes, uh, some of those, 49 I think is the right number, and some of those were, 32 I think were already damaged. So some of those have access and look really vulnerable to the person on the ground, but have no protections. So you, so you know the ones already in theory that would benefit from additional protection, and you can estimate how much it costs in the past. It seems like something that would be really digestible for the public and policymakers to say this is how much it will cost to fix these places right away. A good idea. Um, Nancy? The budgeting stuff is tricky. Um, government entities, government agencies' budgets are unbelievably tight and restrictive and all of those things. So, And we're going to come up with some whoppingly big number, I'm sure, which would be really informative to have. But what I really wanted to say was that Olivia Glenn is here. She's the director of DEP's Parks and Forestry, if any of you didn't recognize her. <laughs> You know, she, she's been, so we've been talking, like I said, when, when staff levels change, you know, we continue to talk and have good relationships, and this is an example of one of them. So we, you know, I mentioned to Olivia yesterday that we had this presentation. I didn't know at the time that I might be dragging all the commissioners along with me to share it, but um, 
So, and so that's just good. And I don't know if you have any specific questions for her. She'd be happy to try to answer them or we could just let her be. I think, <laughs> I think Commissioner Prickett did have a comment. I don't know if it's a question specifically, but. Well, actually it, it does have to do with the DEP. Um, and uh, I know we had a um, representative come in. Was it Texall came in uh, a few years ago, Mark? And uh, we, we talked about the effort by the DEP and how they were going to evaluate and and determine whether they need more um, state park police and you know address it head on. Uh, I'm just curious whether uh, DEP has seen a slowdown as a result of um, uh, in encounters with the state park police and, and OTV uh, ATV users. Um, I have a sense that uh, public awareness, both on the hiker and environmentalists, uh, a, um, ATV users, the public in general, is, is more aware of um, the damage uh, in the parks. And um, I think maybe people were, were voicing their opinions, whereas a few years ago, uh, that probably wasn't so much the case. It wasn't organized. Um, so I'm hoping as a result of that uh, awareness that everybody involved will you know, stay on the road and not damage these, these ecosystems where about 85%, if I remember correctly, all the TNE species are found 85% in the wetlands and the ponds. Um, I, I think it's hard because when you watch TV, um, there's a lot of car commercials uh, where you see vehicles yeah. driving. I mean, that's the selling point. Yeah. And it's really hard to combat that. Um, but from my point of view, I, I hope there's some slowdown. And I hope that DEP can provide us with some evidence that uh, the status of the situation. Um, I, I'm certainly uh, impressed with the study. And, and all the cooperation between the DEP and all the uh, nonprofit groups, and uh, I just hope that can continue. I know there's a passion from all points of view on this, and uh, I, I, when you have a passion like that, I mean, um, the parks are for everybody to use, but not destructively. To you know, use them so that future generations can get as much out of those parks as we have. So. Uh, I don't know whether you can address all those concerns today, but you know there are some of the things that are on my mind. So, thanks, thanks for being here, uh, Olivia. Have you entertained stiffer fines and impoundments of these vehicles with signage ahead of time? I always thought that that would be the best deterrent to actually impound the vehicle or stiffer fines right on signage inside the roads. conservation officers on wildlife management areas probably that we suggest we're going to end this conversation as well. Um, State Park Police is a lateral entity to the Division of Parks and Forestry. Uh, so we did have staff that was a part of the Division of Parks and Forestry and New Jersey Natural Land Trust. Their staff are also within the Division of Parks and Forestry. Their board is in but not of. Um, I would suggest that after this, and this research was just amazing. Um, I think what we can do is now just take this research, share it with state park police officers, conservation officers, and just our other staff to look at uh, the many things that I think we can really consider uh, as ways to use this computer. So uh, certainly, I'm not in a position to say whether or not we're ready to do that, um, but it's certainly something that we could vet as a real process. I th if my recollection is, is correct, that sort of increasing fines and things like that is a, a different issue, that there needs to be legislative changes for motor vehicle codes, that that was part of the problem originally, that no one had that authority because there's nothing on the books that covered it and that there needed to be a change to do that. I thought the DEP could just put in their roles very, without an actually act of Congress. I think they do that quite often under <laughs> violations. That's, those are different roles. <laughs> I, I thought one of the reasons we designated the ro roads was to give DEP the authority to enforce. We, we, we didn't have that. We, did, we, we hadn't designated, so they didn't have a basis to say, you know, you're doing the wrong thing. And I thought that was one of the reasons that we went it forward. It was part of it, and they put up those signs to establish the codes. But the fine part, when they write tickets, they're motor vehicle codes. So that's, that's the problem, yes. And that was to help them with signage and, and enforcement and getting people. But... In terms of impoundment and bigger fines, I think that, I think that, I, as I recall from the conversations, but I'll double check, that that was you had to change those codes as well so they could write bigger tickets. 
one of the things that I recall from one of the DP representatives was the was the need to make this a motor vehicle violation, which would be reflective of points and insurance costs, as opposed to an administrative violation of a park regulation, which is a cost of doing business, perhaps, uh, to, to some of these people. And I, I don't know, I don't know what's required to do that. But if you, you know, if you started to get points on your license and and insurance surcharges, you would think twice about some of the bad behavior and and as the chairman said you know the parks and the are there for everybody to enjoy but to enjoy responsibly and not to damage and not to be destructive so, olivia i appreciate your being here and I, I i hope we can continue to work with dp on this john the data is unbelievable and i think extremely helpful um i want just one question so we're using maps we're using aerials from 2007 do we know when the next time aerials are planned to be done for the pines? Well, there are more recent aerial photographs available now. It's just we, we started our vegetation mapping and pond mapping and, and damage assessment then. So we continued with those aerials to finish. You can go through and update it, but that's 4,000 spots you have to look at right. using new photography. That's another reason for the model is, you know, that'll help direct us to where we might need to go first rather than doing another aerial assessment. It takes a long time to look through all those photographs. I'm sure it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, just one last question. The, the barrier that DEP's been using is a wooden barrier. We tend to, in Ocean County, we often use guardrail, number one, because it's available. Number two, we have the crews to put it in. Is, is that just an aesthetic consideration to keep it wood as opposed to use guardrail? Because DOT <laughs> will have sections of guardrail that have been damaged, but other sections aren't. So they're used to replacing these because of accidents and so forth. And maybe you can steal some scrap from uh, DOT and, and get more places protected is my kind of thought on that. But I mean, the wood stuff looks much better, it really does. It does. It, it, it sounds like we, I mean, in addition to coordinating with DP, we might want to sit down with DP and DOT to talk about how, what, what enforcement mechanisms we need, what authority we need to try to better protect the, the ponds. Chairman, I do have one question for Director Glenn, if I may. The, the point was made uh, by John Vanell about some of the roads that we have actually pass through some of these ponds. That would seem to be an obvious problem that uh, we would want to act upon uh, immediately without trying to calculate uh, what is the risk of off-road vehicles coming here. I and mean, the road actually leads people into the pond. Does the DEP have any kind of uh, policy in place for dealing with those or plan to address those? Um, I will say that now that this study is finished, we definitely plan to take a look at this study to see what are some considerations we can put in Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And, and, and I'd like to. I'm sorry, but some of the things that complicate that is where do those roads go? Uh huh. Because if we cut them off, there's, I just remember from prior conversations with DEP that as you start to talk about these things, they get increasingly complex because if they leave sure. somewhere, yeah. then that's a problem. Or yeah. it's something that needs to be considered. And are right. there alternate routes and right. things like that? Right. I'm, and, I'm if just you close road, and if you close that existing bad road, will they then just make worse roads. Well, obviously, right. but I think these are yes. questions that probably should be high priority right. ones to right. ask. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, my thanks to you, Director, for, for coming along. I think Commissioner Arlone is right. It's always great to have someone here from the DEP that, that we can uh, converse with about these issues. So thanks very much for coming out here. Any other questions or thoughts on this issue? All right. John, great job again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we're going to move to the general public comment and just a couple notes before we get started on general public comment. Number one, if you're if you are here to make a comment regarding the Bass River um, fire tower, uh, keep in mind that uh, the record is not yet open. So those comments will not be included uh, in the executive director's report. That is, as it sounds, as we were told today, it looks like that'll be at the next meeting. So if you're here to make a comment to put that on the record, 
that'll be next meeting. Um, secondly, we do have a, a quick packed room today, so try to, if we could try to keep your minutes as close to three minutes, your comments as close to three minutes as possible. And then uh, that being the case, I do have a sign-in sheet. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, I don't understand why the record isn't open on the, the fire tower. The application's here. Does it wait until we get the staff analysis before the public comment period opens? Uh, so, so that triggers the public comment. Yeah, yeah, it's, just not, it's not deemed complete. It's not been posted. It's not, it's not been deemed Okay. Okay. And it, ha it hasn't been posted then yet? Is, is that right? Not posted for comment. It gets posted then Right, because we you, you gave us notice, but I didn't know. Right. So I mean, I, I understand that the administrative completeness may be the trigger, but it might might it not be appropriate to get public comment on whether it's administratively complete so that we take that into account when we make that analysis. They, they, they can comment to us. It's, it's just it's not it's not part of public the, the public record that she's going to put on her executive director's report. OK, so they can't they, they can absolutely can comment. Okay. What I was saying okay. is that right. it's not it's okay. not part of the record on the application. All right. so they, 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 they have to comment. resubmit that if they want in the record. Yeah, they have to resubmit that into the record. Right. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so uh, our sign up list uh, for public comment uh, first is Carol Pittsburgh. Up here, there's a microphone right up here. Man. Uh, yes, I'm Carol Bitsberger, uh, Bassover Township. Uh, I just wanted to make, a, uh, that I didn't plan to make a comment on the uh, Warden State Forest. I think it's very interesting that somebody in on the commission brought up uh, possibly new technology and I, nobody else commented on it. And we are in our present day. We should be looking forward to new technology. Um, I did read in the minutes that the, um, well, let me, let me start again. Um, I just wanted to make sure I had the correct schedule for the, uh, application from ba the Bass River for the cutting of trees in Bass River by the bars by people. And as I, I think I understood correctly, it's that be that, uh, um, the, you have the application, uh, you're reviewing it, and you're, it's going to be discussed at the March meeting, okay? And I'm not sure when the public comment section is scheduled. Is it the same day or will it be the next month? So before we get any further, let's because I'm sure there's a bunch of people who have that question, let's let Chuck and, and Nancy give that overview for everybody so that it's clear. Okay, the application was received, it's being reviewed by staff. The way our review process works is that at the March meeting, there will be an opportunity to submit public comment on the record before the commissioners at that meeting. You can submit written comments whenever you like, um, up to that day. At the end of that day, the public comment period close, staff reviews all the comments that were received, all the questions that were raised, and then writes a report, which goes to the commissioners to vote. Okay, so when do the commission vote will be in April? April. If we get the report done, that's ideal. Okay, that's what I'm trying to, you know, uh, understand. And um, who? What is the definition of an interested party? If an interested party, for example, if you review it, uh, wants to write an appeal, what what is an interested party? Uh, just being a resident of Bass River Township, person who pays taxes, etc. Um, or do they have a right to file an appeal? <clears throat> We're not permitted to provide legal advice to the public. So our, your DAG cannot provide legal advice to okay. the public. So you heard the response. I didn't hear so that. We said we, our staff can't provide legal advice to anybody who wants to file any kind of potential appeal. So um, 
that would be up for you and or your your representative to oh. determine that yes okay to the public, and, to the public yes yeah, yeah. 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 and um uh, someone from Bass River did forward um statistics from the Oregon buyer um bars buyer um uh, and I hope all I'm saying is I hope that all of the commissioners will look at that statistic those statistics uh supporting uh the use of camera systems thank you thank, thank and, you and it was received and distributed to all commissioners but thank, thank you, you. Sean, one, one more clear clarification apparently we know that the public comment period is going to end at the commission meeting next next month we don't know when it's going to start yet is that fair let me respond to the commissioner's question then if i I'll follow up as necessary so there's nothing in your regulations uh, that, that says that the public comment starts on a given day. So someone hypothetically can comment today on an application that has not been filed with the Pinelands Commission. Now we would advise them that we do not have such an application, but there's nothing in our regulations that specifically says when the public comment period begins. Uh, in this particular instance, the, the legal notification has been provided in the newspaper is required by your rules that the application is, is filed and, and public comment can be accepted at, at any point. The final public comment would be, and it's anticipated to be the commission meeting in March. If I may, I mean, that, that sounds like it's in conflict with what I heard before. Are you saying the public comment period is open right now? Yes, the, the, the public comment. Yes, there's nothing in your regulation that precludes public comment uh, right. on a particular application. The, uh, I'll say the practice has been that the public comment occurs at, at the commission's meeting uh, when the last opportunity, but the public comment period is open at all times. Joe, does that mean that it's on the record whatever, whatever the uh, state today at public comment? Is that on the record? I think I would... <laughs> That's a that's a difficult question. Let me try to answer, and then I'll defer to Stacy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 if I, I mean, I don't understand. It's, it's, it's a public meeting. This is it's recorded. Why isn't it on the record today? Is the application complete? Is complete? The application has not been determined to be complete at this point. Right, but you said there's nothing in our regs that talks about the opening. Of public comments, so isn't public comment open today? As, based on past practice, I would say that's not what we've ever done. We've had a process that we followed. Most of these applications don't generate this kind of interest, so it's not an issue. Um, but that's what I was told the practice was. Once we deemed it complete, which means we knew that the whole thing was there and wasn't going to change, that's when we would, you know, trigger and people could, you know, comment on that. And you would announce that the comment period is then open you to the public? The report that says that, yes. That's posted online. So the activity report today says it's been filed. At some future date, it will say it's been de deemed complete, and that's when we'll begin to take public comment. That's right. So somebody can they can send a letter tomorrow. Right. And I'll be put in the files with. I, I you know I I hear you, but if if a written comment comes in tomorrow or today and is part of the public record, I don't understand why testimony today isn't. Uh, and it yeah. could be, uh, you know, if we have it on the record and it'll right. form the decision, if something specific gets raised, we're not going to ignore it. That's my concern. So, is it anybody, anybody who makes a comment here today, does that get documented into your, into the executive director's report or or not? I mean, that, that's what my question is, and I want to make sure that I'm clear to the public on that as well. I would say yes, but that's just me being someone who tries to be but it's a but it's a comment on an on an incomplete application at this time on an, on an application well, that's not been deemed you know, complete. To be honest, a lot of the comments that we would hear today would be general or based on the prior application because I don't think we've had much requests to look at the application. Okay. Like one or two, but so they would be general and yes, okay. so they will. <laughs> All right, so next up, Jennifer Curley. Good morning. Um, morning. Just in an effort of things flowing easier for you, if there's other people that are here to speak on either the, the Bass Tower issue or the off-road vehicle issue, I would let, I would 
offer to go last so that you have a fluid movement of items discussed. That's fine. We'll okay. Jump to the, if to that's the, back. the end, that's fine. I'll come back at the end. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Paula Yudkowitz. And then followed by Rose Sweeney. Holly Edkowitz, Oakland, New Jersey. Where do we? Oh, first of all, I want to thank Olivia Glenn from coming down from Trenton. It just so heartens us to see the DEP is taking an interest in this and going to be actively involved. And thank you very much. I don't think we've seen that before. Um, we were talk. Somebody was talking about recreating in the Pine Barrens and the families. Families cannot get into the interior of the Pine Barrens. Their average family vehicle cannot get down on main roads, can't get down at sign road, stagecoach road, can't get to Ampton Furnace because the roads are so destroyed. You have to have a monster truck. You have to have pig tires. You have to have four by four. And that's, that's not your average um, New Jersey family. They can't buy those vehicles. So they are shut out right now. They are shut out of the interior of the Pinelands Reserve because their vehicles cannot get them in there. And it shouldn't be something where that kind of vehicle is required to use the Pineland Reserve. Um, when you're talking about mutters, mutters are not going down the roads to just slowly drive down the road having a good day. You're not gonna get your truck mudded. It's not gonna, you're not gonna have mud on the top of your truck. Only if you go through these holes in the roads at a huge rate of speed, spin your wheels, get that mud going. That's the fun they want. And then the next person that comes by then can't get down the road. You, you are abusing, you're doing something you shouldn't do. Um, and I, I, I constantly hear, like if a little kid came to me with chocolate all over their face and I said, did you get into the candy jar? No, I didn't get into the candy jar. Well, how do you, how did, what happened? Where'd the candy go? Oh, somebody came in here, some bad boy, not me, and did it. And this is what we're hearing. I hear from mothers and cheap things. We don't do anything. It's like there's one person 24-7 going down into the Pine Barrens doing all this damage. That's how it's happening. It's none of us. It's just one bad apple out there. And that is not the case. We have to start recognizing it is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vehicles coming into this land every single weekend. They're coming from Connecticut, they're coming from Pennsylvania, they're coming from Delaware, because their states do not allow them to do it in their state parks. So they are coming to our state parks and doing it and destroying our roads so nobody else can have access to the Pine Barrens. We have these Jeep Jamborees, hundreds, at one point, there's no more carriage rides out of, out of Bathstow because that was too much for the roads. But somehow 250 Jeeps coming from something that's sponsored in California is coming to the Pine Barrens, but that's not going to damage the roads. Of course, of course it is. It's, it's, it's being turned into a motor spark park. And if you were going to approve these permits, in the permit, it says themselves, we should have park police with these activities the entire time, and they should be paying for the park police time. That should be part of the permit. When you have a music, something going on in Center City, that's what they do. Philadelphia police came, and the organizers pay for the park police. And we should have park police with all these large events. 250 Jeeps coming through our roads. I mean... It seems like we're accommodating this group to the detriment of everybody else. Once you say these permits are okay, once you let them go out there, once you let them come back, you have now made it so nobody else can use the reserve. And that's what's happening now. And I challenge any of you to take your family vehicles and try to drive around the reserve. I bet you're going to have to call to be bailed out. Rose Sweeney. Rose Sweeney. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Rose Sweeney from Bass River. Good morning. I want to thank um, John for his presentation. That was really well done. 
I want to thank Olivia for coming from the DEP. Thank you, Olivia. Um, I just had a couple questions. So under what circumstance can an individual or group make a presentation to the commission if, if a couple of our better residents wanted to present some information during your open comment period for the tree discussion, how would, how would we do that? Or could we do that? So, man, we try not to make this just a, an open Q and A back and forth. Sure. If, after the meeting, if you wanted to sit, meet with the executive director or sure. with Stacy, we okay. gladly get you any kind of details you need with that. And maybe could we invite Olivia, Olivia to attend um, the discussion as well? Maybe if maybe somebody could from the commission could extend an maybe could extend the invitation to Olivia as well for this this comment period. Okay. <laughs> um, and I guess one other general question is when does the commission expect the potential new members to be confirmed by the Senate if, if there's a timeline or is it months or? Sometimes, you know? sometimes it's days, sometimes it's months, sometimes it's never. Okay. That's out of our control. As the Senate. As yeah. the Senate. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that was it for, um, that was it for those who registered. So we'll go by right to left, show of hands. Right over there, sir. I wasn't going to speak today. I'm Tom Hedden from Tabernacle, but I've actually installed the wooden barriers in Wharton. Um, and you guys were talking about costs, so I thought I'd just give you some information. I believe all of the wooden barriers in Wharton have been installed by volunteer labor with some help from Rob and his staff. Um, at least that was the experience we've had. I believe there was some shared cost on the materials that were used for the installations, um, but the labor was Rob, Tom Keck, and one staffer and about 15 volunteers that did Mount Misery. Um, and to Olivia, thank you for coming, Olivia. Good to see you. Uh, we at Open Trails New Jersey have had an outstanding uh, offer to install balusters wherever they're required. Uh, we have the equipment, we have the personnel, and we're standing by ready to go. And we've been reaching out to the DEP to try and arrange that. Since the new administration has come in, we haven't been able to get any, any volunteer projects off the ground. And there's been a lot of other issues with the superintendency in Wharton. You know, Rob was gone for a while, he's back. So we're hoping to continue that process. And Open Trails New Jersey stands ready again to install barriers or do whatever volunteer work is required of the superintendent. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I'm here from the East Coast Enduro Association as well. And I would like to underscore what was in John's report that the statistical relationship between enduro courses and damage in wetlands is non-existent. This is what I'm on about. <laughs> uh, we really do, we, we also do hire the state police. Uh, they, we have park police that we pay handsomely for at all our events, both Saturday and Sunday. So those are my points, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else for public comment going this side? Man, all the way in the back. She beat you to it, sorry. Good morning. I'm Ryan Greck from Pinelands Preservation Alliance. Uh, first off, I would like to wish a happy birthday to Pinelands, the Pinelands Commission. Um, it was on this date in 1979 that uh, Governor Byrne established the commission by executive order uh, to implement the very unique regional management protection plan um, in response to concerns in the Pinelands, uh, in the Pine Barrens at the time over development, the jet port. Um, so to that end, I would very much like to commend the Pilots Commission staff on the pond study that was presented today. That was a great presentation. Um, and as mentioned, this is groundbreaking work. There's not a lot of other data like this out there. So, um, so this was a very important study that was done. Um, and I'm, in regards to the ORV issue, I'm glad to see, thank you to Olivia for being here. I'm glad to see such um, interest and I appreciate the discussion that has taken place today about that. That's very uh, encouraging. PPA staff and volunteers uh, have witnessed extensive damage. We've been very much a part of the uh, work done to install the barriers. Um, our volunteers that we work with are highly trained. We have tools. We have the budget for it. We're, we are willing to do the work without asking for money from the state. At this point, we just need the permission from DEP, from Parks, to we specifically have a couple of areas in mind. The Cherry Hill Road area, there's extensive damage there. We're looking to install barriers at that 
location, as well as we've been working with uh, some other entities, scientists from Rutgers, to monitor pine snake habitats. There are some specific snake nests that we would like to protect as well. So we request the commission to uh, encourage the DEP, if possible, to grant us access to do that, permission to do that. We're ready and willing to do the work. Um, we encourage, as has been said at past meetings, for this ORV issue to be an ongoing discussion, uh, perhaps in a standing agenda item on the meetings. Obviously, this is an ongoing issue. Um, the first aerial photographs that we saw today were back in 2007 showing damage. It's gone back even prior to that. So this is a very ongoing issue. Um, and finally, I would like to offer on behalf of PPA a tour to any of the commissioners that are interested to some of these heavily impacted sites. It really is getting out there and seeing them in person that uh, you really kind of get the full scope of the damage that's been done. So that is a standing offer um, that I'd like to make to any of the commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dave Dempsey from Shimon um, with Garden State Jeeps, Jersey Devil Jeeps, multiple different Jeep groups on social media. Um, I just want to let you know that I have been working on education. I've been uh, taking small groups out, showing them different areas, showing them different signage, showing what not to do, what can be done to enjoy the forest responsibly. Um, and the other thing as well is three years ago, we faced a problem out there um, that was pretty well known. Since then, the, the state park police, it, the amount of times you see them out there doing what they're supposed to be doing has improved tremendously over the three-year period. Plus, um, I'd also like to uh, provide before and after pictures of some of these ponds out there. They, um, a lot of them have came along quite a ways, uh, restoring themselves naturally. And one of the um, areas that was uh, barricaded off by Open Trails, New Jersey, which was Jemima Mount, now even has um, pine trees growing up in the uh, middle of the trail as well. So where the efforts have been put, there's definitely been some success. And uh, just wanted to give an update on that. So um, anybody specifically that I should send the before and after pictures to? Oh, everything goes through Nancy. OK, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving across the room, is there any other comment? We're here. All right, we'll go to the last call, public comment. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. I apologize. Jennifer, come on up. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, executive staff members, and public. My name is Jennifer Curley, and I'm the senior staff representative from CWA Local 1040. We represent 70% of the Pinelands Commission staff. We represent your dedicated employees that are members of three collective bargaining units. They are the professional level, the non-professional level, and supervisory units. I am here before you this morning because your staff has been working for 43 months without a contract. And although we are currently in contract negotiations, we are gravely concerned that we may be reaching a deadlock in our effort to achieve salary parity with our members' salaries and their counterparts, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm getting over a cold, so please forgive my voice. <clears throat> I'd like to thank you for pro providing me with the opportunity to address you this morning. I'd also like to thank your executive staff for the time they've spent in bargaining with CWA. We want to emphasize that our principal goal has always been to achieve salary and benefits parity with your staff's counterparts at DEP. We compare your staff salaries and benefits to the New Jersey DEP counterparts because of the identical skill sets and job titles that are common to both staff at both agencies. <clears throat> you know well that many on your staff have devoted their professional careers to preserving the Pinelands. They are scientists, planners, educators, regulatory reviewers, cultural resource experts, IT professionals, and support staff that work collaboratively <clears throat> and with outside parties to protect that region's natural resources. Since fiscal year 2007, 
unfilled vacancies at the Commission have increased steadily, resulting in a total of 23 unfilled full-time equivalent positions. This means that 35% of once filled commission positions are now vacant. As a result, many of your staff are doing double or triple duty, performing complex tasks. In seeking salary parity, we've been told that our goal is unrealistic. We've heard at the bargaining table that our comparison to our DEP counterparts is false, that our members are not state employees. We note, however, that the title State of New Jersey is proudly displayed on all official Pinelands Commission documents. And the highest ranking official whose name appears on official commission, commission documents is none other than the Honorable Governor Phil Murphy. We're not persuaded by this semantic argument. Let it be clear that our members will never be dissuaded from taking pride in working with you as New Jersey state employees protecting the New Jersey Pinelands. We've also been told that we are not civil service employees. An, irre an irrelevant comparison, as none of our salary disparity issues are due to civil service protections, but have rather been awarded to DEP counterparts through the same process of collective bargaining process that we are engaged in right now with commission's executive staff. Before I go on, CWA Local 1040 would also like to congratulate the Pinelands on its 40th birthday and to say thank you for 40 years of landmark land use planning and natural resource protection of the Pinelands of New Jersey. CWA also wishes to extend its gratitude for the Commission's adoption of Resolution PC 4-1743, which awarded excuse me, a 5% salary increase to your staff in December of 2017. That action represented an important step in bridging the salary disparity between your staff and their NJDEP counterparts. But we must take this opportunity to put that 2017 5% salary increase into perspective. It came after your staff and their families received no merit-based increases, as is called for in the commission's own personnel policies in the preceding 10 years and no cost of living increases in 2011, 2012, 2015, and 2018. Including that 5% increase, your staff has seen their salaries rise by 1.1% in the 10 years since 2009. By contrast, NJDEP employee salaries have risen at an average annual rate of 4.9% over this same time period. To recap, 1.1 annual percent for commission staff salaries and 4.9% rise for NJDEP salaries over the same 10 year period. The reason for this disparity is due largely to salary givebacks forced upon the staff here at the threat of, threat of and execution of layoffs and the loss of merit-based merit raises by your staff while their eligible DEP counterparts continue to receive their merit-based raise every year during that period. We have faith that, the, faith that the Commission's executive staff will work with CWA in shrinking the salary disparity and will continue to work towards achieving salary parity with your staff's DEP counterparts. We respectfully request that the Pinelands Commission insist that your staff be valued equally to the value placed on their counterparts at NJDEP. We have tried to negotiate a contract that would prevent Commission employees from losing further ground to their counterparts and would restore merit-based raises. However, because of management resistance, we agreed to drop most of our proposals, including merit-based raises, for a contract ending on June 30th of this year, with across-the-board raises that are the same as state employees received. In return, we ask that the Commission grant two additional things that the state granted to its employees in their most recent contract. A modest one-time bonus payment for employees who did not receive step increases and a waiver of health care deductions from back pay. There is no reason to believe that these payments would be unaffordable, yet management has rejected our proposal on both items. We are respectfully asking the commission to reconsider as a matter of fairness to its employees. In closing, I would be happy to offer the commission members the detailed comparison of your staff and the NJDEP staff increases beginning in July of 2007 the first year that CWA Local 1040 came here to the commission. 
um, and began representing all three of the units. And again, I thank you very much for allowing me to address you this morning. Thank you. You didn't hear last call. Come on. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I, was, I was live streaming this. <laughs> that, was that was really useful. Um, hi, everyone. Jason Howell, Pondless Preservation Alliance. Uh, the Pond Study, again, amazing work done by the staff and the commission. You really have to congratulate them. That was just really well done and well put together information. We have something of an existential crisis in the Pine Barrens. And, you know, it may not be obvious on first look, but once you get out into the forest, there's no place that has not been affected by this issue from Cape May National Wildlife Refuge to Collier's Mills to the Forked River Mountains. Everywhere is seeing damage and not just in the ponds. Um, a similar study could be done on the dunes, the paleo dunes formed by the same paraglacial processes, extreme, extremely uh, intense winds coming off of the glacier and flowing, digging out areas and forming these really unique habitat types in the Pine Barrens, which are very you know, important for species like Northern Pine Snake. We have, like Ryan said, the tools and the resources, the know-how, the budget to get all this done, except we face resistance from the bureaucracy within the DEP to actually go out and accomplish these projects. And that's where we need your help. We can solve this problem through messaging, like Dave suggested, and tours, and through on-the-ground physical projects protecting these places and encouraging our law enforcement officers to do the right thing, get out there and be there and raise the fines. And I think if we work on this problem together, we can solve it. But the, the time is now to decide where we are going to go. Are we going to be a giant off-road vehicle park? Or are we going to be a place where multiple people can enjoy the place and not be afraid to go in the woods and get run over? And not be afraid that your favorite places are going to be damaged and trashed and all the rest. So this is the time to decide. And I hope you will all join us and move forward on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to close uh, general public comment. Um, we do have some items for closed session. Um, do we have, do we anticipate taking any action out of closed session or is this just going to be updates? Just updates. So um, feel free to hang around while we retire into closed session, but we will not be coming out and taking any action. Um, so again, um, we, first, I guess we're going to need a motion to, or do we need you to, we need to read the, uh, yeah. The blurb. The blurb. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, whereas the Open Public Meetings Act provides that a public body such as the Pinelands Commission may meet in closed session to discuss and receive updates about any collective bargaining agreements, including the negotiation of the terms and conditions thereof with employees of the public body. And whereas also the OPMA provides that a public body uh, can meet in closed session to discuss any pending or anticipated litigation in which the public body is or may become a party. And whereas the commission desires to retire to closed session to discuss uh, both uh, the ongoing collective bargaining matters that are proceeding, as well as um, certain appeals pending um, and some updates in connection with those, uh, most specifically the New Jersey natural gas matter. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the commission shall at this time meet in closed session to discuss the above mentioned matters. The substance of the closed session will be discussed publicly only when, I'm sorry, not discussed, it's closed. Uh, publicly only when, when it will not impede the state's ability to participate in the litigation and or the collective bargaining process. So do we have a motion on what she said? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, second. Second. All, right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Feel free to help. We'll probably be about 20 to 30 minutes at most. So feel free if you want to hang around. That's great. If not, have a great weekend.